Well, welcome. Man, it's so good to be with you. All of our campuses, Sunnyvale, Fremont, North San Jose, are you excited to be in the house today? Church Online, thank you for joining us today. We're in a fun series, and it's all about hearing God's voice. I wonder if you've ever been in that place where somebody came up to you maybe and said, I heard God say this to me about you or to encourage you with this. Or maybe you sensed it at some point in your life, God may be speaking to you and you're kind of puzzled at what that meant or is it really God or is it the bad tacos I ate last night? What is it? See, it can be a little bit strange to figure out how does it work when God speaks to us. Last week, Dr. Krish Kandaya came and spoke a great message to open up our series. And he talked about how God often speaks through our loving hospitality towards strangers. It is a, was a strange phenomenon, but God does this. He will speak to us and use us when we welcome those around us that are far from him or that are strange to us at times. But today I want to talk to you about how God often speaks in whispers. Not necessarily physical or literal whispers, but in subtle voices that are in your soul, in your heart, in your mind that can greatly impact your life. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but there are people all throughout history who believed they heard the voice of God in their innovation, their movements, the, the products that they created, and it's already changed all of us. I want to give you some examples of this. So for example, there is George Washington Carver. He was affectionately known as the plant doctor. He once asked God to reveal to him the secrets of the universe, but instead, God pointed him to the peanut. And I know it sounds strange, but he said, God spoke to him and said, I want you to go figure out the secrets of the peanut. So he went on to follow the, what he believed was the voice of God. He discovered things like this. The peanut butter came out of his discoveries. Cosmetics, paint, oil, marble, plywood, even the dye used in Crayola crayons came from those discoveries that were all connected to the peanut that God pointed him to. Those inventions, for all those inventions, Carver would say that God spoke to him about them. So it might be safe to say that if God doesn't speak to humans, we would not have peanut butter. And that is a very strange reality to think about. There's also some uh, other great people in history, like theologian uh, and scholar William Tyndale. If you have a Bible, you might see his name written on the top of your Bible, because William, William Tyndale lived in the 1500s. He believed that God spoke to him about translating the Bible uh, into English from the original text and making it available to the common people. See, in that day that he lived in, it was illegal for the common person to read the Bible on their own. They had to go to a priest and so forth, and it was illegal for him to do what he felt called to do. But he believed this so strongly, he went on to translate the Bible, and he began the movement of getting the Bible into the hands of thousands and thousands of people. And we still benefit today from him hearing the voice of God. There's a stay-at-home mom named Gail Pittman. She was a, a, a mom that felt like she heard the voice of God, and, and it said this, turn this idea I put in your heart into a business venture, and then she followed her joy of decorating pottery and started what's now known as Gail Pittman Design, became a large company that inspires beauty and creativity into household items till this day. A stay-at-home mom who heard the voice of God and turn it into something that impacted even us today. Gary Starkweeder, an engineer who worked with innovative companies here in the Bay Area, like Microsoft and Apple, he invented the laser printer. And he's, he's, he said that part of his invention was being guided by the voice of God and the inspiration of that voice. So it might be safe to say that without God speaking, there's no laser printers, there's no peanut butter, and there's no decorative household items uh, like we have today. But perhaps one of my favorites is Martin Luther King Jr., which we celebrate today. Yeah. You see, he was a phenomenal person. But 12 years before he died for the cause that he believed in, he had another encounter with Jesus. And it says in his biography that one day he put his head in his hands, and he bowed over the table, and he says, oh, Lord, 
he prayed out loud. I'm down here trying to do what's right, but Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm afraid the people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I cannot face it alone. And then it says he sat there, his head bowed in his hands, tears burning through his eyes, and he heard a voice in his soul. It was a presence a stirring, like an inner voice was speaking to him in quiet assurance. And it said this, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I will be with you even to the end of the world. He stood up. He said, Jesus is with me. He is my strength. He went on to start a movement that reminded people that every person is valuable before God regardless of their color. Aren't you grateful that he heard the voice of Jesus that day? All these people heard the voice of God and it changed all of society. You see, there is a truth. I'd love for you to repeat this with me at all of our campuses and it simply goes like this. God speaks, we hear. Can you say that with me? One, two, three. God speaks, we hear. See, a lot of times we learn that we ought to speak to God because he'll listen to us. And that truth is very powerful and it can very much transform your life. But the other reality can actually be more transformative to you than the first one, which is that not only we can speak to God and he can hear us, but God can speak to us and we can hear him. In fact, Jesus said that this is the very thing that would be the distinctive of those who follow him. Not that we're able to speak to him. Every religion, every faith, faith speaks to him. Every person at some point talks to God. But those that hear him are his followers. In fact, he illustrated this through an illustration of a shepherd and a sheep. He said this, my sheep, they listen to my voice. I call each of them by name. I lead them out and they follow me because they know my voice. In that same uh, 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 event that he was illustrating this, he said it twice more like this. He says, my sheep, they listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's the distinctive of those who have been adopted into the, the family of God. You see, those that are able to hear him are those that have said, I want to be the sheep of Jesus. I want to be in his family. So it is a right of those who have been adopted into the family of God. Hearing God is your inherited right if you have been adopted into that family. And what that means is this. You've said, Jesus, I believe that you died on my behalf and the sin that separated me from God has been dealt with on the cross because you conquered sin and death for me. So now I can not only speak to God, but God's words can speak to me. See, I don't know sheep a lot, but I do know dog. And I have a beautiful dog. Pastor Andy and I used to compete about our dogs back in the days. Uh, I still believe my dog is extremely cuter than his dog. But here's the thing I love about my dog. I call her and she comes. If you call her, she probably won't come. It's a strange voice to her. But if I call, she recognizes my voice. In fact, I can be a mile away and I can say, Miley. And she starts to do that. <laughs> she loves her daddy. And I love her. This is how it works with God. When we come into his family, we start to be able to recognize his voice, and he leads our life. See, in those days, similar to today, people would brag about their prayer life. They'd say, God, I, I can pray these elaborate prayers and say, oh, majestic, majestic God of the heavens. And there's all these people that walked around, and they bragged about their ability to speak to God. And Jesus here changes their narrative. He said, actually, it's not speaking to God that will define my followers. It's God speaking to them. It's God speaking and we listening and hearing him say. But here's the problem. A lot of times we'll ask God questions, right? Like, who should I marry? What direction should I go? What's my purpose, God? What do I do at my school if someone is not mistreating me? What, how can I get better friends? Or what peanut butter jar should I buy at Safeway? There's a lot of options, right? But we don't often really believe God will speak. It's like we ask a question and we don't assume God will talk back. And in this series, 
we are talking about how to hear God, but I am, even as I look back in my life, I started to be so grateful at all of these events throughout, even this event today of our Commissioning Sunday of people that heard God and responded. I'm so grateful that back last year in March, pastors Andy and Stacy, when they heard God say, I'm tapping you on the shoulder for a new assignment, that they didn't just say, God, I'm going to ignore you. That they said, you know what, God, I know it's going to be hard, but you have our yes, because it's going to lead to tremendous fruit in their ministry. I'm so grateful that when I was wrestling with the sense of calling even to lead this church, and I, I, was, I was saying, God, would you confirm it for me? Not just in my own heart like you have, but in others around me. I remember being outside of a coffee shop, and in that moment I prayed that prayer. One of my best friends, Billy Rogers, calls me. On our, he's from our staff, and he says, Fee, sorry to interrupt you. I just felt like I needed to call you to tell you that Sarah and I believe you're the one that needs to lead us forward in this church. And if you do, we're with you. And I remember my heart just burning and tears just flooding down my face because God was speaking. I'm so grateful for even the, the day, weeks after, when I'm wrestling. God, what is this going to look like for all these transitions? And I'm, trying, I'm on a prayer walk, and I'm, I'm trying to strategize my way into this reality. And as clear as a human voice, but in my soul, I heard God say to me, stop trying to plan that which I've already decided. You just obey. Obey me. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful. God speaks. We hear I'm grateful for my spiritual director. He's actually here with us today that over the last like seven years, I've go, I go to his house every single month and he helps me hear the voice of God in the numerous occasions that he helped me confirm that voice that I felt in my heart through the scriptures and through the longings of my heart, through the things I noticed God doing around me. See, God is able to speak and it changes us every time he does so what we're doing is we're looking at an event that happened in the life of Jesus right after the resurrection. So all throughout this series, we're looking at the road to Emmaus. There's two of his followers walking from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus, seven miles away. And they have an encounter with the living Jesus after the resurrection. Before I go into it, though, I want to point to our resource page one more time. Because there's some of you here that you need to go a little bit deeper into this topic. And I want you to know there's a book called Hearing God for Normal People that in inspired a lot of our series here today, and I want to encourage you to buy the book, to go maybe on Audible or read the book, uh, click on your digital program on the resource page, and find all the different resources. It will also explain why we believe that this, these two followers of Jesus were actually a married couple, a husband and a wife, walking together toward their home in Emmaus. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 24. If you have a Bible, you can open it there, or you can follow along with me on the screen. It's a large passage, so stay with me okay verse 13 right after the resurrection of jesus it says this that same day two of jesus's followers were walking to the village of emmaus seven miles from jerusalem as they walked along they were talking about everything that had happened and as they talked and discussed these things jesus himself suddenly came and became began walking with them but God kept them from recognizing him. Remember that phrase. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And he stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. And I love this. Jesus just plays along. And he says, what things? It was all about him, right? Like, what things? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who came to rescue Israel. Remember that little phrase. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. Notice they were sad, but they said the report was amazing. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. 
Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone just as the women had said. I want to point out, as Dr. Krish said last week, most of our problems in life come from not listening to women. And that's what happened with these disciples. They heard the news. Women came running. We saw the tomb empty. An angel appeared. Jesus is alive. And they were still puzzled. And even this couple right here was still scared and confused and in unbelief. And then Jesus said to them, oh, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe what the scriptures, what, what the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took him through the writings of Moses and the prophets, explaining how all the scriptures were concerning himself. Remember that. And then by this time, they were nearing Emmaus at the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going to keep going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them as they sat down to eat. Listen to this. He took the bread, he blessed it, then suddenly, and then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly, their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. And listen to what they said. Didn't our hearts burn within us? as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us. That burning, that, that voice, that's the whisper of God. In that moment, they recognized Jesus was there all along. We just weren't recognizing him. There's so much to learn about how to recognize God and his voice in our lives from this story. So what I'd love for us to do first is talk about why they didn't recognize him immediately. There are a, a few reasons that I think are very specific to them, but also speak to our reasons why sometimes we don't recognize him. The first one, if you're writing this down, is this. There are some psychological reasons. There's a well-documented psychological condition. It's called this, inattentional blindness. And you might not know the term, but you've experienced this because it's when our brains fail to perceive a thing right in front of us when it flat out contradicts our prior assumptions and expectations. So the assumptions and expectations we come at a situation with impacts what we receive from that situation. That's why you can come to a church environment like this, and there are people like today, they walk out of our services and they'll say, God spoke to me, that was powerful, I met God, and they were very impacted. And another person, perhaps right next to them, in the same exact experience, will walk away feeling nothing. Because our assumptions coming into an environment or our beliefs of something impacts that which we receive from whatever that is. It is called inattentional blindness. This is actually what happened to them in my opinion. In fact, listen to what it says. Their comment to Jesus. We hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. See, what they thought Jesus was going to do didn't happen. So they, were, they had some blindness they were experiencing, perhaps because they were believing the wrong thing about why Jesus came and who he was. Like many in, our, in their culture and in ours, they misunderstood what Jesus was trying to do. They hoped that Jesus would be a political leader that would rescue Israel from the oppression of the Roman Empire. Instead, Jesus came and he said, I'm not here to deliver you from a government. I came to deliver you from the grip of sin. And the spiritual reality was not what they understood because they were blinded by the physical reality that they believed was going to happen. See, they thought a more godly leader would be what their nation needed. But Jesus constantly reminded his followers that I'm not of this kingdom. I'm not of this earth. I didn't come to release you from the oppression of governments, but from the grip of sin. He didn't come so our lives would be more comfortable under a more godly government, but so that we would know how to be godly under any government. Do you see the difference? This is a shift of perspective. So when we think Jesus advances what he's doing on earth through government or whatever else might be our misunderstanding, we often will miss on his voice personally to us when he says, love your neighbor, know me, love on me, get to know my purposes for you. Could it be that your inability to see or hear Jesus 
is connected to the perspective, the preconceived ideas that maybe are not quite real, inaccurate, that have kept you from hearing him. Honestly, sometimes it's because a spiritual leader that carried the name of Jesus with them mistreated you. And then you walked away thinking, if that's what Jesus is like, I don't want him. Or maybe you've seen it in government leaders, right, that represented Jesus in the way they communicated, but not in their character. And so the inaccurate perspective of who God is has kept you from knowing him. Could it be that God's saying, let me rewire your beliefs? Would you open yourself to understanding and knowing me in a fresh way without the inaccuracy of what you've seen lived out in other people. Let me rebuild my image in your heart. See, I think there's some other reasons as well. There's a physiological reason. Jesus seemed to have looked differently after the resurrection than before the resurrection. We don't know exactly how this works, but there was something that was not familiar to them. And I think the principle behind it is this, that sometimes we miss God's presence because he no longer appears to us or speaks to us in the familiar ways of yesterday. So we're saying, God, I remember how you spoke to me back when I was young in this way and that way. I want you to do the same to me now. Remember how that day you confirmed your word to that person. I want you to do that again now. And we're telling God how to speak when he's saying, hey, would you open yourself to a new way, a fresh way of me communicating with you? There's fresh manna for you. There's a fresh substance for you I want to give you. If you come again to me and not rely on yesterday's word for today's strength, I will speak to you. And perhaps that's part of what was happening. Could it be? That he wants to open our minds to new ways of seeing him and hearing him. But I think there are some spiritual reasons as well. And perhaps they are the more significant ones. Because it actually says in the text that God kept them from recognizing him. Isn't it interesting? Because sometimes we pray, God, like, God, would you just show up to that person? Because I know then they'll believe. Right? Like show up like an angel in their room and shake the room. Let there be lightning and a loud voice because I know then I'll believe and they'll believe. When God is just waiting, perhaps, for something else to happen for, before he reveals himself to us in bigger ways. See, I think that he was trying to reshape some of their beliefs first. In fact, it says that Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from the scriptures the things concerning himself. He was trying to rewire some of their beliefs, and they had to open themselves to it. But sometimes, here's a principle for us. We don't hear God speak because we just simply don't have his word in our hearts See, the way that God speaks primarily to us today is through his scripture and the spirit of God breathing these words into our soul. Next week, our talk is just about that. Pastor Stephen's going to bring a word for you that's so powerful. You don't want to miss it because he's going to talk about how to hear God from the living scriptures, not just reading it for yourself, but how to let God speak to you through it. That reality would change you. Sometimes we're saying, God, speak, 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 but he's saying, can you put my words in your heart so I have a vocabulary to use to speak back to you. And that reality is perhaps part of what they were experiencing. Jesus told them all again how everything in their past and in their, that he, they had learned was pointing to him. Sometimes God is waiting for us to give him credit for yesterday before he leads us into the new realities of today. There might be some other spiritual reasons as well. For example, sometimes God won't speak to us because he already did and we haven't obeyed the last command, Right? <laughs> Like he said to you, can you start giving? Can you start being generous to those around you? Could you forgive that person you've been holding on to and forget unforgiveness with for a long time? Would you start loving those that hate you? And you're like, no, I'm going to hate those that hate me. That's what I do. And then God says, okay, but until you do, I'm just going to wait here. And they would say, well, God, well, speak to me about other parts of my life, please. And he's saying, I already spoke to you. Sometimes he's waiting for you to take that step of the last thing he's revealed to you in a whisper. And maybe it was a whisper and you say, God, I, a whisper was not good enough. I, I need the angel. But when he can trust you with the whisper, 
man, it changes you. Then he starts to speak more and more and more. He knows if I tell them a whisper, they'll do it. And so I'm going to keep speaking to them over and over again. Here's the thing that most encourages me about all of this. See, they had doubts. They had blind spots. They had probably preconceived ideas that were false or inaccurate beliefs about who God or Jesus came to do. They were not even in the inner group of the 12. They were not like in the elite group of disciples or apprentices of Jesus. They were two people walking away, but they did end up seeing and experiencing Jesus in a revealed and personal and powerful way. And the question is why? Why is it that in spite of all that they did, and I, I think there are some key principles. I want you to write these down because they are the same principles that apply to us. See, number one is they were open. They were open to God. Did you know that your openness to God has a lot to do with how he communicates with you? In fact, Jesus said it this way. He says, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding will be given, and you will receive even more your openness to hear God's voice is connected to your ability to hear him. See, when Jesus explained the scriptures to this couple, they received it. Their eyes were open. Their hearts were burning. They were ready for him. And I think Jesus knew if I tell them, they're going to be open to me. In fact, it's not just that they were open to the big voice from heaven. They were open to the whisper. In Job 33, it says, God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. He speaks in dreams and in visions of the night when deep sleep falls on people, and then he whispers in their ears. God is constantly whispering in our ears. And here's the truth. God speaks, but he often whispers in our ears way more than he shouts from the skies. And if you're constantly just looking for the shout from the skies, you will miss the whispers that can reframe your life, that can rebuild your identity, that can inspire creativity in your work, that can help you innovate in your school. He is whispering constantly to us. And perhaps part of why they heard is reason number two. They had silenced the busyness in their life. I don't think it's a coincidence that it was when they were walking away from Jerusalem in a seven-mile walk that they experienced Jesus. See, Jerusalem was like the center of noise, especially that weekend. It was a Passover weekend. It was a, every person from different nations would come, a lot of activity, notifications, and busyness, and it was not there that Jesus appeared to them. It was the, when they decided to walk away and they were in the silent, uh, silence of a little street to the road to Emmaus that Jesus decided to appear to them. See, don't let the noise of the world keep you from hearing the voice of God. This is why we're asking you, we've talked about this in a, a couple weeks ago, to consider actually walking away from your busyness for one week in what we call a mission trip. And in your digital program today, there's a link there. I want you to explore this. Everybody at Echo, okay? There are trips this year to Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Mexico, Brazil, all kinds of places. These trips, you might not have done this before. They're called mission trips because we go on a mission. And for one week, all you do is you walk away from your business and you serve and you love others and you partner with one of our global partners to advance their mission locally. These trips is when I've seen, seen people be trained transformed, see miracles, see God at work, hear God speak to them. And it, there's a cost to it. In fact, I'm taking my whole family this summer to one of these trips as well, and it is life-changing, and I don't want you to let the cost keep you from doing it because God will provide it. We're going to fundraise together. But if you have a little whisper in your soul right now that's like, I should explore taking a week off this summer or this spring or this fall and going on one of these trips, would you respond? Would you click on there and just say, I'm interested in it, and we'll follow up with you because it can lead to incredible transformation for you and your family. The next part, though, is I think 
that part of the reason we don't hear God is because of all the background noise of our lives. Most of the time we don't hear Him simply because we haven't made enough space away from the noise, the notification, and the stimulation of the day, so we don't know how to silence our lives. It sounds something like this. God is speaking, but it's hard to hear Him. And when He says He loves you, or go this way, or that way, it's really difficult to discern His voice. And we're wondering, God, why can't I hear you? Well, listen to this. When the volume comes down, you feel like this is loud. Sometimes God's waiting for you to say, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to shut off my phone. I'm going to sit on my chair in the morning. And God, I'm going to remove distraction. I'm going to go on a walk. I'm going to walk away from my busyness because your word matters to me than the noise around me. Could it be that sometimes the reason we don't hear God speak is simply because we haven't given him space out of our busyness for him to do so? Could it be that he's got ideas and innovative thoughts and all kinds of other words for you that are just there waiting for us to give them our space. I think another couple of realities is this. God often speaks to people that are willing to act. If we show him we're willing to act, he will speak to us more often. But I want to dive in the last reason that I think is so important for us today. See, this couple, in the midst of their confusion and before they even know it was Jesus, they invited and they begged Jesus into their home. They invited him in to the most intimate part of their lives. And because of that, their eyes were open. In the midst of their curiosity, in the midst of them exploring what this all means and not quite understanding, they said, Jesus, I, I, we want to know you more. See, I remember when I was young and I had that prayer, that same exact one, where I'm like, Jesus, I don't really, it's confusing to me. I don't really know if I believe, but would you come and speak? And it changed me. That's what happened to them. And I don't think it's a coincidence either that it was around the table in the fellowship, in the community of others, that they, as they ate their meal together, that Jesus decided to reveal himself to them. This is why so often, in fact, this whole month, we're asking you, join a group, join a group, join a group, because in that community, the togetherness around the table that we invite Jesus to the center is when God often speaks to us. Take the step. Sometimes here's what we do. We say, God, speak to me in isolation, that which God wants to speak to you in community. Yeah. And so you're waiting for God to speak to you, and you say, why aren't you doing it? And he's saying, I'm not yet, because there are some things I'll only tell you in togetherness, and you're not there yet. And he's waiting for you. And when you put Jesus at the table with you and you invite him in, it's so powerful what happens in that community. Join a group. Don't miss out on that part of God speaking to you. I, I love it that they said, it. stay the night. It's getting late. And he went home and sat down with them to eat. God wants to speak to you. In fact, I believe he's trying to speak to you. Even right now, there are whispers in your soul. There are longings he's given you. There are thoughts that maybe even throughout the last 40 minutes, he's given to you. And he's waiting to see, will you respond? Will you open yourself to him? Even if you have doubts, confusion, maybe it doesn't all make sense yet, like for this couple. Would you just say to him, Jesus, come in to the most intimate part of who I am. That posture is called trust. It's called faith. And your faith in him is all you need to have relationship with him. It's an invitation that he waits for us to respond to. It's that place that requires us to come with open ears, to make time away from busyness, to respond to him by saying, I'm going to give you more of my space throughout the day. It's right there that you'll hear him whisper to you. Students, it's there that he'll whisper to you about how to conduct yourself in school. Singles, it's there that he'll speak to you about your identity. 
those of you that need a relationship to be renewed, it's in that place that his spirit will speak to you and breathe life into your relationships. He can give you creativity in your work. He can guide you in your community. He can reshape the wounds of your past and make them the very strength of your future. But it is one whisper away from changing you. And all he wants is for us to say, I will invite you in. So what we're going to do at all of our locations is our band is going to sing a song over us. It's a little bit different than usual, but it's an old song. It is a very simple lyric. It says, Jesus, I want to make my life about you. It's all about you. So I'm coming back to a heart of worship. The heart of worship is the heart that says, Jesus, I want my life to be submitted to you. And I want to make it all about you. Would you use the next couple minutes to make your commitment to him, to respond to the whisper in your soul right now? Would you pray with me? God, we're thankful that you speak and that we can hear. Would you build your confidence, build confidence in us? God, that when we speak to you, you listen, but that when you speak to us, we can also hear. Speak to students and young professionals and adults and every category of person in our community. Let us be a people that recognize your voice and act on it. Would you confirm even now, Holy Spirit, the steps that we ought to take to join groups and focus on mission and respond to you in forgiving others and whatever it is you're whispering in our souls. We are open. Speak. In Jesus' name, amen. stripped away then I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within and through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Oh, it's all about you deserve though I'm weak and poor all I have is yours every single breath and I'll bring you I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's 
all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about Father, we thank you for this moment, the simplicity of the truth that it's all about your son, Jesus, the sacrifice that he made for us and the opportunity we have to respond daily. So as we lean into the rest of this series, our weeks, Holy Spirit, would you empower us to hear your voice? And that we would drown out the world and make it all about you, King Jesus. We ask these things humbly in your mighty name. Amen.